today is we are going to talk about concurrency, right? And well, even in Ruby conferences, we are hearing a lot about concurrency in general. And uh, I think it's, it's like two years ago since I've been, I guess, it was Oroko, and there was a talk about concurrency, and it was talking about those different concurrency paradigms, right? Like actor's model, software transactional memory, and I had no clue what that was about, right? So I've studied a lot of uh, subjects since then. I've read books. I've tried different programming languages. And my talk today is a digest of what I've learned, uh, what are those different models? When is good to use one or another? I mean, there are theoretical benefits and trade-offs, right? And uh, what I'm going to talk today is one special kind of yes, one special kind of concurrency, which is single-process multi-core concurrency, right? Because People doing, for example, deploying Rails applications today, you are doing multi-process, multi-core, right? So if you have a machine that has like four cores, you are starting a number of Rails processes, so you can use all cores, right? We are not going to talk about this today, right? I want one process to use all my cores, right? And why this is important? Because the number of cores in our machines, they are increasing, right? So my machine has four cores. I guess most of you has at least two. I guess it's probably hard to buy a machine with just one core today. Uh, if you are buying like uh, servers, you can easily get a server which has um, 16 cores, right? So we don't want to start 16 Rails processes in the future, right? That's just too uh, much memory that it's going to consume. We are going to talk about this particular thing, and uh, to talk about it, I want to go to a beautiful world filled with unicorns, apparently, which is the world where we don't have state and we don't have concurrency. And here, apparently, everything is easy. And I'm going to show you how, right? Uh, we call this, uh, not we, but people that study this kind of stuff, they, they call this a declarative model. And it relies a lot, it maps a lot to mathematics, right? So in this world, there is like no mutation. You cannot mutate stuff. If you assign to a variable, you cannot change the value of a variable. It's like mathematics, right? If x is equal 1, x is equal 1. You cannot change it, right? Uh, and there is no concurrency. Everything is just functions, OK? So what can you do with it? Uh, in my slides, I will be using pseudo Ruby code, OK? Sometimes I'm going to introduce keywords that do not actually exist in Ruby. but you all be able to follow, right? So here I'm defining a lambda, which I'm going to be calling function also along this presentation, right? So I'm defining a lambda, define a function that receives one argument, and based on the argument, I can recursively calculate the factorial of a number, okay? That's what I can do here. It's a declarative model, I can do mathematics. So I want, if I want to manipulate lists, classify text, I can do all this kind of stuff, right? What is important in this model is that everything is deterministic. And by being deterministic, it means that every time I call a function with the same argument, I have the same result back. Right? I'm going to repeat because it's very important. Every time I call a function with the same argument, I'm going to get the same result back. Right? If everything is deterministic, if we have this rule, it means that we can't have I.O., right? Because when I call like standard uh, input get and I try to get something from the input, every time I call this method, I get something different, right? It depends on my input. So I can't do I.O. I can't do random, obviously, right? Because every time I call random, I get a different result. And so we say that there are no side effects, right? I should not be able to call a function that is going to change something in my system. So I can even talk to the database, right? Because, for example, what, how you have side effects with your application when you do like post create? You are calling a function which is post create that's going to change the result of another function which is post.all, right? So we don't have side effects. We don't have this kind of stuff, okay? So everything always returns the same result. Why this is important? Why this matters, right? Imagine that we have this other function, lambda, that receives two arguments, right? And we we invoke another function called expensive function that receives A, and we invoke another expensive function passing B, and then return the result of C plus D, okay? 
What it happens here is that since we have no side effects, everything is deterministic, the compiler, the runtime, the interpreter, whatever is running our code, it can do really cool optimizations, right? Let's suppose that every time we're invoking this function, it's very common that uh, A is equal 1. Like 80% of the time, A is equal 1. Our interpreter can say, hey, it happens that A is equal 1 most of the time. So instead of calculating extensive function all the time, I'm simply going to replace it, right? So it checks if A is equal 1 very frequently, I can just change the result of expensive function called with A by its result that I'm saying is 42, right? So the compiler can do this optimization. Why? Because calling that function or not calling that function is not going to introduce any side effects in the system, right? There is no way calling that or not calling it is going to change the rest of the code, right? So that's what it means it's deterministic. We don't have side effects. And this is awesome, right? This is what we end up doing manually in Ruby, right, when we do memoization, for example. Okay. The compiler can do that for us. We don't need to worry about it. Okay. Another thing that we could do is imagine we have the same example and let's suppose that for some reason uh, invoking also expensive first than expensive function is faster, right? Actually, C compilers, they, sometimes they change the other instructions, right? But here we can, let's suppose that for some reason it's faster, right? So I can just change the order as well. It doesn't matter, right? There is no way that calling a function in a specific order is going to change the result of the other ones, right? So we can do all this kind of stuff. So if we have this deterministic thing in one place, we can, uh, we, we allow the compiler to do a lot of optimizations for us. And then they say, oh, this is beautiful, but does anybody use that in real life? And there is a language that uses this, which is a language called Haskell. Who already uh, played before Haskell? Sorry, guys. I don't like Haskell, but it's very interesting. Anyway, uh, Curing. Uh, so, okay, Haskell uses everything we're talking about for determinism. Uh, it uses determinism for performance and expressiveness, uh, expressiveness, right? So, an example. So, we have this thing called Curing, and this works in Ruby 1.9 today, right? How curring works? Imagine you have a lambda that expects three arguments, okay? And then I can call this lambda passing those three arguments. But I can also curry this lambda, right? And basically what it means is that instead of passing the three arguments at once, I will pass, uh, I can pass them one by time, right? So here I am calling l.curry.1 and it's returning, returning me another lambda. And then I can call with, with two, which is going to return me another lambda. And when I pass all three arguments, it's finally going to give me the result back, okay? This is what we call curry, right? And why this, this is important, right? This is important because we can uh, generate functions uh, based on other functions, right? So if I have a multiplication function, if I want to have the double function, I can just curry and pass two, right? Because now I'm expecting the second argument, which is going to apply to this function. So we can create functions uh, based on other functions, right? So this is cool, right? This is nice. And in Haskell, what it happens is that, wait a second, just let me move a little bit my microphone, because I feel like there's some air. Is it good, still the sound? Yeah. Awesome. Okay, in Haskell, uh, this is the default. You can curry all functions by default. You don't need to call that special method curry, right? So here I have a uh, function ABC, okay? And then I can call it this way, and I can call it this way. Those are actually equivalent uh, conceptually in Haskell, right? They are exactly the same. So you can think, oh, isn't Haskell going to be slow then? Because if every time I'm calling a function with three arguments, I'm actually calling it with one argument, and then it's returning me another function, and then it's returning me another function, you can think like, oh, Haskell is going to be like extremely slow, right? Because every time it's generating those intermediate lambdas, right? Which is what we saw in Ruby. And what it happens is that not at all, right? Haskell is actually extremely fast. And why? Exactly because in Haskell, all code that's deterministic is split from the non-deterministic code. So if your code is deterministic, Haskell knows. Has Haskell has a special notation to put non-deterministic code. So if you have a code like this in Haskell, right, that, oh, we are calling an expensive function, and then 
you're calling, you're calling some with one argument and then you're passing the other arguments later, right? The compiler in Haskell can actually reorganize everything, right, to be just one function call, right? So those things in Haskell, you can do function composition and this kind of stuff extremely easy because of this idea, right? You have the deterministic code is split from the non-deterministic code. So far so good, everyone? Great. So this is what I wanted to talk about, this beautiful rule where we don't have state uh, nor concurrency. And you're going to take one step further and you're going to turn just concurrency on for now, right? So this is the first concurrency parad paradigm we're going to talk today, right? So let's turn concurrency on. So states is still off, but concurrency is on. And what we have is data flow variables, right? And basically, it's painless concurrency. Why? Because imagine that we have the same code, right? And expensive function also expensive, as you know, is expensive to calculate. And say, hmm, I want to calculate those ones in a thread, OK? So what do I do? I just put the thread block. And that's it. I don't need to change anything else in my code, right? Everything's still going to work, and it's going to use my cores, OK? And that's it, right? If we were in Ruby, since we depend on the value of C, we would have to call, for example, thread join. We would have to have a pointer to the thread and get the value of the thread and do this kind of stuff, right? But here, no, we just need to do that. Why? Because, because since, again, the code's deterministic, the compiler can do uh, guesses for us, right? So what happens, let's suppose we are going to execute this code, right? We are like the runtime. So we enter the lambda, right? And then the first thing we do, we create a new thread. And we, when we create this new thread, we see that this new thread defines C, okay? So we know what is defining C. And then we create this other thread, right, that defines D. So when we get here at the end, we say, oh, I need the value of C but I don't have it yet because I know that thread's calculating it. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to automatic, automatically wait that thread to finish so I can get the result of C. And the same will happen for D, right? So this is awesome. You just put, hey, run this in, run this in different cores, just run this in threads, and it works, voila, right? So what is happening? I have the main execution, just what I just said. We are going to create the thread one. We are going to create the thread two. And when we want the value of C, we don't have it yet. It's not bound. The value is not set yet. So we are going to wait until the thread one defines C. And then we are going to, again, we need the value of D to sum uh, both values. So we are going to wait for thread two, and then we are going to sum them, right? This is a very simple concurrency model, and it works great, OK? And that's it for now. That's what we can do. It's very simple when it's running on all cores, right? But there's a problem with this. What is the problem with this? This is not the real world, right? Uh, the code that we write is not deterministic. We need to do I.O., we need to talk to the database, we need to get information from the standard output, right? We need to push something to a socket, okay? We cannot use those things, right? What we need, we need state. Not necessarily an internal state, but we need an external state, an ex a uh, state that is going to be shared to everyone, right? We need global state. And so if we need global state in order to build our software, in order to build our programs, we need to turn state on, right? So now we have state and concurrency one, which is when <laughs> things go bad, right? Uh, so We are going to talk about uh, three models uh, here. And um, so the whole issue is that we now we have a global state that we have to manage. And we need a way to uh, manage the access to this global state, right? I'm going to show some examples. So we're going to talk about three models. Two of them are based on shared memory, OK? One is using locks, and another one is using transactional memory. and. Uh, Another one is message passing concurrent model, okay? The problem we are going to solve is very simple. So imagine that we have a class counter. Our classes are global, right? And this class has an accessor, which I'm going to set it initially to zero, right? What I'm going to have is that I'm going to have several threads reading the value of this counter, incrementing it by one, and setting it back, right? 
since this guy is global, this counter i is shared, right? We are going to run into problems, right? So which problem are we going to run into? So we have these, right? So imagine we have on the center column the counter i, and then we have one thread on the left and another thread on the right. What is going to happen is that first our counter is with the value of zero, and then the thread one is going to read this value, increment it, and set it back. So far so good, right? And then thread two is going to start executing it and it's going to simply read the value. So thread two reads the value. But here's the deal with thread, right? We don't control their execution, right? So what can happen is that the thread two can stop just right after it, need, it reads the value. So it just read the value and stopped, right? And after it stopped, the thread won't say, oh, so I'm going to continue my work, right? So the thread one is going to read the value again, increment it, and set it back, right? And then for some reason, thread two says, hey, I'm going to finish what I was doing, okay? And then it's going to increment the value and set it back. So now I was supposed to have a value of three here in the end, right? Because we executed everything three times, but our value is still two, right? Those are the problems you ran into when you have shared state and you're doing concurrency, okay? So how, how we can solve this problem? So let's first talk about locks, which is the most known approach, right? So what we're going to do is that uh, we are simply, here again, it's of the Ruby. If it was Ruby, we could simply create a mutex, but that's not the goal. Uh, I just want to show very simple. So what I'm going to create here is that I'm going to wrap this code that's changed the shared state inside my thread. I'm going to wrap in a synchronized block. And what a synchronized block does, it says just one thread can run this piece of code at the same time. Just one thread. Okay? So what is going to happen is that uh, if we do the flow again, we start with zero, thread one increments it, set it back, and then when thread two is going to run it as well, it's going to start the synchronized block, right? So even if thread two stops now, there is no way thread one can execute the same piece of code, right? If thread one eventually reads this code, it's going to stop also, okay? So we can ensure that nobody is running that piece of code at the same time, which is great because now thread two is going to increment the value and just after the block is committed, right? Just after the block finishes, thread one is going to continue and increment the value again. And we're going to have three at the end, okay? So this is great, we solved our problem, right? What are the benefits of this approach? One benefit is that, well, it's the most popular approach. Being popular does not mean that it's good, but it means that uh, we have a lot of books, we have a lot of resources, uh, almost uh, all programming languages that provide threads, you learn about them in their reference books, okay? So this is good, right? Documentation is good. And this is also good because we have explicit control over the lock, right? If you want to synchronize a piece of code, you go there and put the synchronized stuff, and that's it, end of the day, okay? But it's bad also because we have explicit control over the lock, right? Why it's bad? Because who has explicit control over the lock? Us developers, right? And we do mistakes, and we do a lot of mistakes, actually, right? So. If we developers are the one responsible to go figure out what, which part of my code is accessing global state and try to synchronize everything, we are going to do mistakes and our software is going to be broken, okay? So that's bad, right? And what's bad in this approach is that it's pessimistic. Why is it pessimistic? It says that for that one piece of code, just one thread can execute it at the same time. If I have a thousand threads, when I'm that piece of code, just one thread can execute it, right? Maybe it would be fine if all threads execute it, right? Maybe nothing wrong would happen, right? This is the thing about threads with state. They are non-deterministic at all, right? It's very hard to reproduce. So maybe it would be fine. But even for your say, no, just one thread can run, okay? So this is bad, right? So uh, the next model we are going to see about is an op optimistic approach. Okay, uh, it's called software transactional memory, and it's made 
popular by Clojure, who already played with Clojure. Clojure is very hot lately, so I would advise you guys to check it out. Uh, there are like some big uh, Ruby names uh, playing with it, like Chad Fowler, Jim Wired as well, I guess. Uh, Carl Lurch, Lurch, that's from Railscore, they're all playing with Clojure, so it seems that it has some sugar. So, software transactional memory. Software transactional memory reminds us of how database works, right? And it's going to work like that. Here, I'm like borrowing the words from Clojure. So now our counter, you can see that our, uh, the value of i, we are wrapping it in a reference. What is a reference? A reference is something that we can just change inside an atomic block. So this is good because it's a way to ensure that we are only going to change that value in a safe place. Okay? So this is a really good start. It's not necessarily exclusive to software transactional memory. We could have that with threads, right? But here, uh, Clojure is doing like that, so I'm reproducing it here. And now what we're going to do is that instead of wrap, wrapping our code in a synchronized block, I'm wrapping it in an atomic block. Okay? So how does this work? Let's go to our examples. Uh, we start with counter zero. We do the same thing. We read it, increment it, and set it back. Okay? And then thread two is going to execute. Okay? So thread two is going to read the value and start the atomic block. And let's say that, for some reason, thread two is going to stop. It's not going to finish, right? Thread one is going to execute again, okay, increment it, and set it back, right? And after thread one sets it back, thread two is going to execute again, so it already had read the value, so it just needs to increment it and set it back. But at the moment we are going to set it back, what is going to happen is that at the end of the atomic block, what uh, our runtime is going to do is that it's going to compare the value of the reference at the beginning and at the end, and at the end of the block, right? So what's happening here is that our runtime is going to say, hey, something's wrong, right? The value of counter i from the beginning of the block and at the end of the block, it changed, right? So I cannot continue, right? Someone changed the data and it's no longer valid, right? So what I need to do is the same I would do in a database is that if we, if we verify that our data is no longer consistent, we roll back, right? So this is exactly what uh, Clojure would do for us, right? So it would roll back, it would undo the changes and start the atomic block again by reading the value, incrementing, and set it back, right? So how this works? Basically, it lets all the threads run. And just in case, if it see that there was some difference in state, someone changed that value while thread 2 was running, uh, it roll backs and start again, right? Why this is good? This is optimistic approach, right? It's letting all threads run. If one goes bad, we are going to start that thread again. Great. And uh, implementations can guarantee that we are not going to run into deadlock or race condition with something common with, with threads and locks, right? Sometimes you can have a uh, thread locking the other and vice versa. So there is no way you can solve that problem when we have a deadlock. Okay? So this is good, right? Um, however, it also has its downsides, right? One first downside is potentially unnecessary retries, right? Remember that. If we think that thread one is executing all the time, it can always block, it can always change the value, and the thread two is, not, is never able to commit. This sometimes happens in databases. So you have a production website that has a lot of queries. Sometimes you run to exactly the same issues, right? One thread cannot, as it can never commit its transaction because the other threads always change the value it depends on, right? So you're going to be retrying, 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 right? There is also the transaction overhead, right? Now, our runtime, our language need to be aware of the values of the references before and after the atomic block, right? You need to keep those values so it can compare at the end. So there is a whole overhead, and there is the fact how you're going to deal with side effects, right? Imagine that inside an atomic block, you, you've written to a file, right? How you're going to roll back right into a file? Or maybe you printed something in the standard output. How are we going to roll back printing something in the standard output, right? So we have to deal with this. I think the way, I'm not sure, but I think the way Clojure deals with it is simply by not allowing you to do this kind of stuff inside the atomic block. But it's something that we have to be worried about, okay? 
And um, the last model, those are the two shared memory concurrent models. And the last model we are going to talk about is message passing concurrent model, okay? Here, everything changes, right? It's another category. Here, we no longer have shadow, shared memory, okay? So it's, it changes conceptually how we have to think because there is no way anymore that we can have those two things accessing a shared memory directly, right? So the whole idea of message passing concurrent uh, model is that if you have something to share, you need to expose it uh, with a server, right? You need to expose it with an actor, right? So here I'm creating, so this is the syntax I came up, it's not necessarily uh, valid, it's not valid Ruby code, right? I just came up with this. I think that Rubinius has, uh, Ruby, Rubinius has actor model and it has different syntax than this, but basically how it works is that we have a server that is a function, right? This function starts with the value of i, okay? And basically what, what happens is that when we start the function, the first thing that we have is a keyword called receive. And what is going to happen there is that at the moment we reach receive, this function is going to stop. You can think that this is running like in a thread. It, it is an actor, right? So it's going to stop and it's going to wait for a message, right? So it stops and waits for a message. And then when the message comes, we are going to react on it, right? So if it gets a message that, uh, that's increment, we are going to call the same server function with the value of the counter incremented of one, right? And then when we call the same function, it's going to wait for another message. So this is recursive, right? We start with the i value equals zero, and when we receive a message of increment, we are going to call itself with the value of one and wait for another message and so on. It's a message loop. It's waiting for a message and is reacting on this message, okay? And that happens when we receive the message increment. If we receive the message of check, what is going to happen is that we are going to send a message back to the client. So this is when the client wants to know the value, right? It needs to send a check message. And I'm using the syntax, which is an arrow, saying that, oh, I'm sending the value of i back to the client, okay? So check sending a message back to the client and starting the loop again. And if it receives a message that it actually doesn't understand, we are simply going to uh, warn like, oh, I don't know this message and start the server again, okay? So this is a loop, right? We are receiving messages and reacting uh, messages and reacting them, right? And here we are spawning the actor, right? We are uh, creating the actor using this function spawn actor, right? So now we have this thing running, ready for messages. That's what spawn actor does, right? And how are clients going to look like? Our clients going to look like this, right? We have a thread, right? We have many threads that are sending the increment message to the server, okay? And that's it. So you have a server waiting for messages, okay? And the clients are saying, hey, just increment this value, okay? So here it changed because as you can see, even the whole code I designed to solve this problem is different now. So the message passing it changed, it requires you to change how you think about the problem, how you're going to model the problem, right? So how is it going to work? We have a server, right? It starts initially with the value of zero, and then it receives an increment message from the client one, from the thread one, whatever, right? And then the value is going to be one, it receives another increment message, okay? Uh, and then the value is going to be two, then the client two sends another message, and when we want to read it, we can send a check message where we are going to get the value and send it back to you, right? Uh, who implements this model? Uh, Erling and Go, although they implement it very differently, not very differently, but they implement it differently from another. And the whole idea here is that we are not going to communicate by shared memory, right? We are going to share memory by communication. So if you want to access something that's shared, you need to communicate, you need to ask for it, right? This is the whole idea, right? And why this is awesome, right? This is my favorite model, okay? Why this is awesome? Because since, uh, Nobody's accessing that global state directly. There's no need for synchronization, right? Just one actor is responsible for doing that. So you don't need to synchronize. And what is really, really cool is that it's very easy to distribute. In Erlang, for example, this whole message passing, it's abstracted by the Erlang virtual machine. And they abstracted it in a way that it actually doesn't matter if the server and the client, they are in the same machine. They could be different nodes in the same network. 
So this is awesome. The code you write, when you run it locally, you can distribute it very easily, right? You don't need to be, you don't need to be in your machine, right? Since everything is changing messages, you can easily ch exchange those messages between different nodes in your network, right? So this is great, right? But as everything, it has its downsides, right? So if you want to change to share large messages, uh, it may affect performance because now you need to copy a message from one place to the other, right? So if you're sharing megabytes, that's not going to work, okay? Uh, megabytes or gigabytes, I don't know how our computers are getting fast, so this start being less of an issue, but sometimes you have to share bigger files. But you get the idea. Large messages, depending on the system, may affect performance. And coordination between actors may be tricky, right? Because since everything works with messages, it's very hard if you need two clients to see exactly the same value, okay? Uh, one thing that I forgot to mention, so I will roll back, is that those messages, they come as a queue, right? So the server, it's like it has an inbox, and it receives those messages, and it goes to those messages one by one. It's a queue, right? It goes processing those messages one by one, okay? So that's, that's why it's hard to, to synchronize, right? Because uh, since there is a queue, the server needs to go through all the queue to process the message, so it's very, very hard for two clients to see the same message, right? Okay, so summing up, those are the four models I wanted to talk about. Uh, the idea is to give you an introduction of those models. Uh, I'm, they are, Patrick and Tim, they are going to give another talk today, is it today? Yes, uh, they are going to give a talk today that is a little bit more practical. They are going to show examples with JRuby, for example, on how to use uh, some of these. Okay, but uh, what I really want is that to raise an interest because I personally think that concurrency is going to be more and more important uh, in our lives, right? So it's about time that we start researching these things and see how we can improve uh, as a community, as a whole, in this area, right? So, so, how you can learn more, right? So, Dataflow, there is a language called OS, right, that implements it. Uh, Locks, you can use Ruby, you can use Java, C, you have uh, thread libraries as well. If you want to use software transactional memory, uh, there is Clojure. And message passing, there is Go and Erlang, right? But they implement, so Go use channels, right? Erlang use the actor's model, it's a bit different. So it's worth taking a look at both. Uh, I think that Haskell implements all of them, right? Not uh, per se, but uh, with uh, standard libraries and this kind of, not libraries, just libraries. Sorry, not standard libraries. Just libraries, they implement all this kind of stuff. So it's a good one to check all those models working and maybe running benchmarks since you are in the same language. Uh, if you want to try like hopping and stuff, there is Celluloid which is bringing the actor's model to Ruby, okay? Uh, there is also Elixir, which is a programming language uh, running on top of the Erlang virtual machine, so it has all the features I've talked about Erlang, all the features in Erlang you're going to see in this language, but it's a little bit more modern, right, uh, for the programmer. Uh, and I want to talk about, and this is uh, a hard discussion, and that defaults, uh, it really matters, right? Because um, by far the easiest languages to, Haskell is also here, uh, but by far the easiest languages to solve concurrent problems are Erlang, Clojure, and Haskell. And the reason this is, is because they default to immutable, right? You cannot change things in place, right? If you want to change an array, you, ca you can't, right? If you want to append an item to an array, in Ruby you're just going to modify that array, right? You can, we can do this in this language, right? Appending an item to an array is going to necessarily create a new array, right? With this, you reduce a lot, you reduce, com you reduce actually completely the chance of having shared state, uh, shared state inside your code, right? You, because in Ruby, what happens is that I can simply create a counter i, for example, right? And then I have two threads changing it, and I'm going to run into problems. Those things, they cannot happen in those languages. Okay, because everything's immutable. You cannot change things in place. And most importantly, there is no magic bullet, right? So 
uh, sometimes the actor model is not going to work for you, okay? Uh, depending on the issue, the software transactional memory is not going to work for you, and you have to use threads and locks, okay? That's fine. Uh, different problems are going to require different solutions, okay? And finally, some references. I've already recommended this several times. Uh, there's this book called Seven Languages in Seven Weeks, which is going to uh, give you uh, a good introduction on different languages and also different projects related to concurrence as well. If you want to go a little bit more hardcore, there is this amazing book called Concepts, Techniques, and Models of Computer Programming. Uh, this guy, he breaks languages and their features in different sections, and he explains uh, why this feature matters, when to use it, and why not to use it. And it's great because it explains the state, it explains concurrency, it explains laziness, right? This is uh, a really great book. And there are some other references, like some articles and talks uh, about, for example, the personalized structures were given by Hitch Hickey, which is, the, which is the creator of Clojure, right? I'm going to put the slides online and then you're going to have all the links, okay? And that's pretty much it, so uh, thank you guys, and be aware that the team and Patrick is also, also going to talk about it. I think Aaron Patterson is all going to mention a thing or two about concurrency, so we are going to see more talks on the subject. So that's it, thank you very much. Yes, questions? Questions? No question. One question. You talked about no magic bullet, but do some of those techniques you showed us combine easily? Uh, I guess optimistic and pessimistic locking, and uh, it's not good to combine, but what about uh, messaging and uh, optimistic locking, for instance? Uh, what, what about uh, mess messaging, the, the last one? Yeah, you. You, you, can, uh, you can mix, uh, I think, uh, so for example, Erlang is not going to allow you to mix because it simply doesn't have those other paradigms implemented because since everything is immutable, you don't need to use the other paradigms, right? Uh, but yeah, you can mix, I think Haskell allows you to mix. Since Clojure is running, so for example, their language is like, uh, Clojure and Scala that are running on the Java Virtual Machine and they end up having those different parameters as well and you can mix because you, you are, they are not in the same category as Erlang that you don't have a mutable state, right? So what you can do is that you can solve part of your problem using the actor's model, for example, using message passing and then inside an actor you can have some mutable state that you can uh, manage using locks or the software transaction memory. So yeah, you, you can mix them, right? But that's going to depend a lot also on the language and what it allows you to do and what it doesn't allow you to do. Hello. Uh, one thing that you didn't talk about was testing. And I think it's pretty hard to test a mutual state and it's way easier to do it with um, state that you can't modify. What do you think about this? Um, so testing mutable state with things you can't modify? Is that correct? The With the whole models and everything, right? So, yeah, it's, it's basically, I haven't seen yet uh, a good way, for example, of testing that your code is running on threads or that your code's not going to deadlock, right? So, uh, those are very hard to test. Uh, I find message pass a little bit easier to test because your actor is basically an API, right? So you can just send messages to it, right, and then check its internal state, the, the state that's exposed, right? So that's a little bit easier, but testing threads and locks, uh, software transactional memory, you usually can't test that you're running threads and that you're not going to conflict or something like that. The language needs to do uh, its best, in my opinion, to ensure that you're not going to hurt yourself. I, there is one. Um, so, in your example of the actor model, you were showing that you, you move the expensive operation into the actor, right? There was the increment operation on the actor. Yeah. So, won't this become a bottleneck? Like, the whole point of threads is to, to split expensive operations into cores. 
But in your example, you move the expensive operation into a single thread again. So won't this become a bottleneck? Yeah, so that's a very good question. So everyone is hearing their questions, or do you want me to repeat? No, All right. Okay, so that's a good question, because that happens in Erlang. So sometimes you create an actor, right? And this actor is receiving so many messages, and it can be completely expensive stuff, so it becomes a bottleneck, right? Because it has many messages to process, and it cannot process all of them on time, right? So what you do is that you simply make, you, you make like an actor pool, right? So you have a front end actor, and then you can have like more four actors in the back, okay? More four, and then you just delegate to them, and they do the hard part. So there are like some ways of you distributing everything. There are even some libraries already that allow you to just say, hey, I want to spread this in different actors, right? And the nice thing, as I said, is that those actors, they don't need to be in the same machine. So as your code grows, right, you can just spread those actors in different uh, machines in the network. So it's very easy to scale, let's say. Any more questions? No? Okay, let's give Jose a big hand. Okay guys, so we're waiting for Zach. We are aware of the Wi-Fi issue. The, um, actually, the Wi-Fi is working fine as the um, connection, but they're on their way here. We we're working on fixing it, so it should get better soon. Please be there with us. Um, there are a few announcements. Some of you have some cool things in your bag. I mean, actually, all of you have cool things in your bag, so let's run I it now. If you could take away, do you want to give me one? Just look into your bag right now. And one of the things you'll find, you, you can do it now, you can do it later, but one of the things you should find there is this. And it's called a Chinese friend catcher. So all you have to do is, you know, because the Wi-Fi is not working very well and you cannot just be sitting here, you can ask the friend who's, who's I mean, potential friend, who's, uh, who's sitting next to you to stick their finger inside of this. Now try it, there is an instructor that doesn't make sense. I, I do I do recommend you to test it, it's really fun. And then as you kind of pull it, then see what happens. So that's one thing. There is some interaction planned for today. And you can continue doing that throughout the day upstairs. If you see somebody you want to talk to, um, I'm very happy to, to become friends with you. <laughs> and... Okay, I'm not sure if this is going to be very practical right now because of the outgoing connection thing, but there are some old school wires there. As soon as, I guess, we have the network under control, then you can use them. You might try them now, but I don't think that they will be any better. Um, if you see people in gray t-shirts, uh, Dorota, do you want to come over? It's just the t-shirt demonstration. So if somebody has a t-shirt like that, that means they're crew, they're just like, whoa, whoa, yeah? So you can ask them anything, they'll help you. If something is not working, just tell them, because if you cannot tweet it, then just try to find the great people in the crowd and, and complain or, or try to talk to them.